Well, welcome back. Our next guest is a former MEP whose years in the European Parliament merely strengthened his Euroscepticism and a former chair of the European Research Group of Backbench Conservative MPs, perhaps best known, though, for his dodgy dad jokes on Twitter. Uh, joining us now is the Brexit Minister, Chris Heaton-Harris. Uh, thank you very much for being with My us. My pleasure. It feels like it's a bit of a strange week to be interviewing you because it feels like we're kind of in a Groundhog Day. Theresa May is going back to Brussels uh, again to ask for more uh, concessions. Uh, MPs have voted again against the government's uh, Brexit plan. Are we in Brexit purgatory here? Um, yeah, I think it can feel like that sometimes. And certainly in Parliament, it does feel... I mean, the, the words Groundhog and Day are, are mentioned in just about every speech and have been since the beginning of January. But there is actually a process and, a, a, and there is a, a definite plan. I mean, Parliament has made up its mind on a couple of things. One, it voted to activate Article 50, so we are leaving the European Union on the 29th of March. The second, um, and that does mean actually that if we uh, do not have a negotiated deal, then we leave with, uh, without a negotiated deal on the 29th of March. The second is the only positive thing that Parliament's voted for was uh, an amendment by the chairman of the 1922 committee, Sir Graham Brady, um, which is where actually a number of people, the whole Conservative Party, the DUP, um, and indeed lots of Labour MPs came together to say that they want changes to the backstop um, and then they could vote for the Prime Minister's see, deal. This is a problem, though, isn't it? You say you want changes <coughs> to the backstop, but this is a two-way negotiation. Brussels has been absolutely hard line on this. Um, and even your own Conservative colleague, Steve Baker, said the negotiations are a complete waste of time, so, according to leaked WhatsApp messages in the Sunday Times. Yeah, so I, I, I don't think the negotiations are a complete waste of time well, at all. Well, that's good. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm quite pleased about <laughs> that. worrying too. if you said... Um, <laughs> and, and, in fact, you know, there's, there's a huge amount of activity, as you see the Prime Minister's going out to see uh, President Juncker, the... Uh, my, my boss, the Secretary of State in the Department for Exiting the European Union, Steve Barclay, is out there tomorrow. Uh, the Attorney General is going out to Brussels on Tuesday. There is a huge amount of activity on, on this. And there's also a huge amount of noise coming in from individual member states into the European Commission because, actually, everybody wants to have a deal. At the same time, though, we're talking about Groundhog Day and this continued uncertainty is having an impact. I can understand why the government yeah. might want to run the clock down, but it's having an impact for businesses. We can have a look, for example, uh, at what uh, Fly BMI said in their statement uh, explaining the reasons for going into administration. They said, current trading and future prospects have also been seriously affected by the uncertainty created by the Brexit process, which has led to our inability to secure valuable flying contracts in Europe. I mean, this is starting to have real-world impact now. So the government is not trying to run the clock down. The government is trying to get a negotiated deal with our European partners. We've put that to the vote in the House of Commons in January. It did not pass. Um, the House of Commons has decided what it would like to see, which is the Brady Amendment that I uh, mentioned not so long ago. So why aren't and, you speeding things up? I mean, 100 MPs are going on holiday next week. Um, because, as you rightly said, we are negotiating with uh, another group of people. We're not just negotiating with ourselves, as some people uh, seem to think. We are actually in a very broad negotiation with our European partners. We've focused on what Parliament believes is the right thing to focus on, and that's where we're trying to get the deal nailed down. Um, Theresa May has written to Conservative MPs um, today, a pretty sternly worded letter. She's saying, history will judge us all for the parts we've played in this process. If you carry on in the same vein as you are now, how do you think history will judge the Conservatives? Well, history is going to judge the Conservative Party for getting uh, delivering on the referendum uh, result that the British people voted for in massive numbers. 17.4 million people voted to leave the European Union and will be judged because we will deliver on that. Um, there's also a huge number of Labour MPs who will be delivering on that too. The confusion that exists, more than anything, is confusion as to what Labour's policy is. I mean, they, they seem to not particularly know it as they've had to try and clarify it to you now, whether they want to actually help get a deal um, over the line that actually, if you identify the arguments within the letter that Jeremy Corbyn sent to the Prime Minister, he's basically saying, um, we quite like your deal, we just can't vote for it because politics is too important Well, if to you us. offered a permanent customs union, Labour would vote for you. But a permanent customs union is actually staying within the European Union. Well, we, it's we, not, we, is it? We, it's we, not we, staying within the European we, Union, is it? It might not be the kind of Brexit that you want to see, but it's not staying if, if in the If you look European at the... Union. So Labour set themselves six tests for uh, uh, what Brexit should look like. Well, that's their one, previous policy, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, but they there. do like chopping and changing, I do know. But the, one, one of those tests is actually impossible to fulfil. Um, so, you know, they... You know, they 
got a bit of a debate going on in our, their party. I'm not trying to disguise that we haven't in, in the Conservative Party, but the government's position is to get this over the line, a negotiated deal on the, by the 29th, of, well, as soon as possible. Um, and we've got a lot of work to do, working in Brussels this week, huge amount of effort going in to get this deal. You can see why Theresa May might be a bit nervous, though, relying on her own backbenchers to support her deal. When you see what's happened this week, uh, when Conservative, enough Conservative MP, um, Conservative MPs voted against her approach, which meant that she lost that vote. I mean, it's embarrassing, isn't it, when Brussels look at that? Are you frustrated, as a former chair of the European Research Group, at how some of your colleagues have been voting? No, no, I'd like to think I'm one of the most pedantic Eurosceptics you'll find in Parliament. And I can understand how some people um, really do worry about the detail of everything. But this week's... Um, essentially, what happened in, in last, last week is that Parliament decided to vote on for nothing. So we go back to what we'd voted for before. And as I said at the very top of the interview, um, we voted to activate Article 50 to leave the European Union on the 29th of March. And the one plan that Parliament has come behind, that there is a majority for, it's demonstrable. Uh, demonstrable so was it just the government's fault then for the sloppily worded motion? Um, no, 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 I, I, I don't think so, actually. I think in this heightened sense, at these um, amazingly heightened political times of excitement, uh, whatever, um, you can understand on a non-binding motion that people want to um, demonstrate that they are uh, still wanting to have their views heard. Um, now, I mean, we talked a bit about divisions in Labour. There's clearly divisions on the Conservative benches as well. I just want to put to you what one of your ministerial colleagues said in an interview this week. Uh, this is Richard Harrington, uh, the business minister, and he said, talking about the uh, European Research Group, I read that Nigel Farage is setting up a new party called Brexit, and if I were them, I'd be looking at that. In my view, they're not Conservatives. Is he right? Uh, no, but um, Richard is... Uh, I, so I love Richard Harrington. He's one of the best ministers. He's actually um, a no-deal minister in the, uh, in the Department of, for Business, and he's helping me. I'm the no-deal minister um, in the Brexit department trying to coordinate our approach to no-deal, and he's helping me tremendously um, to get this. But we both have, we all have, one singular objective, which is to get a negotiated deal so we don't have to go down the path of no deal whatsoever. How bad would no deal be? Um, well, it's be suboptimal. It's nowhere near the scare Sub story level. What does that mean, suboptimal? Well, it means not optimal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, essentially, a, a deal would be much better for the country. It delivers certainty quicker, um, and it's what businesses are asking for, what employers in my constituency and across the country are asking for. And, uh, you know, I think I'm with the people of Derby who are on your clip earlier. You know, people just want this thing done. They want Brexit delivered. They want their voices heard and, that, uh, and uh, the referendum result delivered upon, and that's what we're going to do. Uh, now, you got into some hot water in the past. No. Uh, for writing to universities, asking them for a list of the names of tutors who were teaching students about Brexit uh, and what they were teaching them about. Now, at the time, your colleague Joe Johnson said it was, right, it was because you were researching a book. So how's, how's the book coming on? Yeah, well, um, well I, I'm on the picture bit now, so I'm ready to colour those in. No, I... So I, as Is there you, a book? No, there isn't a book. Um, well, there might be a book one day, but it won't be about that. Um, so I wrote to universities because I'm interested in Brexit. I, I was a member of the European Parliament for 10 years. I formed the... Uh, I was chairman of the European Research Group for six and a half. I formed the Fresh Start uh, uh, project uh, about a renegotiation with our European partners. Um, I was a whip at the time, and I just wanted to find out what other people were saying about Brexit. I, Maybe you can see I, why some people might have thought it's yeah, like the maybe thought it was a, you know, I, 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 Maybe English isn't my top subject and maybe it was a clumsily worded uh, letter, but I actually just wanted... And most universities took it... Uh, uh, at the beginning, took it in the light it was written and some contacted me to say, oh, what sort of stuff do you want? And this is our reading list and all that sort of stuff. Um, I didn't comment at the time because I was a whip and, um, you know, if I upset anybody, I apologise. OK. Uh, now, just finally, Donald Trump's called on the UK to take back uh, Islamic State fighters. Um, should the UK be taking them back? Well, I mean, the government's primary objective is to... Um, actually, so I don't disagree with what Lord Dannett said on your, on your previous piece, um, but the government's pr uh, primary objective is to make sure our nation is safe and secure. And um, we do have a statute book uh, that can um, properly police and, and make sure... You know, these people coming back, they will undoubtedly be um, talked to possibly arrested and charged um, uh, with various crimes. We've just updated. We just so should they come back? Um, as international law stands, they can come back. Um, I don't think my constituents would be very comfortable with it. OK, thank you very much, uh, Chris Heaton-Harris.